everyone welcome back to my channel so happy to have you here with me for another video if you are new welcome so today's video is going to be a little different i'm going to be going over some case updates which i normally don't do i don't know if i've ever really done it on this channel i feel like i probably have but not that is coming to the top of my head here. But anyway, there have been some major updates in cases that I have covered just in the last few months. So I wanted to go over those today because they're very interesting and you guys have been requesting case updates like crazy on these specific cases. Today, we're going to be going over the latest update in the Alec Murdoch case, which just came out in the last week or so when this video goes up. We're also going to be talking about Casey White and Vicki White very interesting update there as well. And also some updates from the Sherry Papini case. So we're going to get into that. And just a reminder, if you didn't know, I am super pregnant right now. I am 36 weeks, almost 37 weeks by the time you see this video and my baby could come at any time. It's possible this will actually be my last recording for this channel before I have a baby. I don't know. I'm hoping to get one more in, maybe two. We'll see how things play out. And these days I am so tired. I am so uncomfortable and I'm so out of breath. If you didn't know when you're pregnant, your lungs literally get squished. All your organs get squished. It's honestly wild. Look up what happens to all the female organs during pregnancy. It's pretty mind blowing, but it's getting pretty hard for me to record for a long period of time. And I'm running out of breath very quickly. So it's taking me like double the amount of time to record anything. So I thought it would be a good time to try doing a case updates video. You guys will have to let me know if you like this format, if you want to see more case updates in the future, but I'm really excited to get into these updates today because they're super interesting. Things are not looking so good for Alec, Casey and Sherry. But in today's video, I am going to briefly go over the cases or else we'd be sitting here for three hours. So if you're not familiar with them, I suggest watching the full videos that I had done previously so that you understand what I'm referring to to in this video. So all three of these cases have yet to go to trial. So more is going to come out. Just keep that in mind. This is what we know as of the day I'm recording this, which is July 16th, 2022. Also, these cases seem to be changing quickly. So it's possible that there will be an update in one of these cases before I even upload this video. And if that happens, I will have a pinned comment below with that information. So let's start with Alec Murdaugh. Big update in that case. You guys have been sending me articles, tagging me in updates all the past week. I know you guys want to hear my thoughts on this, so let's get into it. It feels like I just covered the Murdoch case, but I guess it will be about seven weeks ago when this video is uploaded that I posted my video on it. But that is a crazy one, people. If you have not heard of it, you'll probably be confused watching this update because there is so much that happened around that family. And I mean, it's like a couple cases in one. Their last name looks like it should be said Murdaugh. And I think I have even referred to it as that during this video. Like I said, half speeds, guys. It's actually Murdoch. That's how you say it. So the Murdoch family is very well known down in South Carolina. They have been in the legal community. Their family has held high rankings in the judicial system. So the Murdoch family is very well known down in South Carolina, specifically in the low country of Hampton, South Carolina. And since the 1920s, the Murdoch family has held an important legal position in that county for 85 years. One family member has held the title of solicitor, which is the equivalent of a district attorney. So for over a century, the Murdochs have been involved with the law. And family pride is huge for this family. They first hit the news cycle in 2019 when the youngest son in the family, Paul, was involved in a boating accident that killed 19-year-old Mallory Beach. And it's believed that Paul was driving the boat after a day of underage drinking and that his reckless behavior led to the crash that killed Mallory Beach. Paul was being indicted for those charges. And then on June 7th, while waiting for that, June 7th, 2021, he and his mother Maggie ended up being tragically shot and killed on their hunting property. And father Alec was the one who found their bodies and called 911. Hey, this is Alec Murdoch at 4147 Moselle Road. I need the police to the ambulance immediately. My wife 
badly. The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division and Colleton County Sheriff's investigators have been on scene all day and night looking into a gruesome discovery on Moselle Road in Islandton late last night. SLED tells News 3 both had at least one gunshot wound. According to several sources, their bodies found by Maggie's husband and Paul's father, Richard Alexander Murdaugh. And many people believe that the shooting of Paul and Maggie was somehow related to the boating accident. Paul Murda was facing charges in connection with the 2019 boating accident that left 19-year-old Mallory Beach dead, leading some to question if the murders were a form of vigilante justice. And since their deaths, as we talked about in the first video, it has been highly speculated that Alec Murdoch was involved in the death of his wife and son. But for several months, as far as we knew, there was no evidence to prove it. And shortly after their murders, Alec himself was involved in a shooting. Hampton County 911, what is your emergency? Oh no, I'm stuck at Hatchie Road. I got a flat tire mm -hmm. and I stopped and somebody stopped to help me. And when I turned my back, they tried to shoot me. Oh, okay, were you shot? Yes. But okay. I mean, I'm okay. But they ended up finding out that Alec had paid a former friend or client of his, a man named Curtis Smith, to carry out the shooting. He said, yeah, you got to take care of this. And I said, well, I can't do it. And he told me he turned his head. I just grabbed his arm, put it behind his head, took the gun from him. Smith claims during that struggle, the gun went off. Then he disposed of the weapon. Yeah, he wanted me to kill him. To make it look like a suicide. Yeah. Man, that man. It turns out that Alec was trying to stage his own suicide. And the point of that was so that his second son, Buster, would receive $10 million in a payout from the life insurance policy. This all led to a ton of investigations into Alec, and it was uncovered that he had defrauded his own law firm and a handful of banks, an amount surpassing $8 million. And that included defrauding the children of a woman who used to work for their family who died on their property. Her name is Gloria Sapp. Field. She was their family housekeeper, and she also helped raise Buster and Paul. She was a big part of their family and kind of played that role for many, many years. But on February 2nd, 2018, she was found at the bottom of a staircase in their hunting property home. Maggie had found her and immediately dialed 911. What's going on out there? Uh, my housekeeper has fallen and her head is bleeding. I cannot get her up. She's still going up the steps, up the brick steps. Okay, so is she outside or inside? Outside. Okay, is she on the ground or is she up near the top? She's on the ground. She's on the ground. She's on the ground. Is she conscious? Uh, no, not really. And this is kind of out of order here, but there was another death of a boy named Stephen who people believe Buster may have been involved in. Again, you should watch my previous video to fully understand that. This case is very complicated and you're probably really confused right now unless you've read something on the case or like I said, watched my other video. That will clear up a lot of questions. So let's talk about the recent updates. It was announced recently on July 12th, 2022, that Alec was expected to be indicted for the murders of his wife and son. Alec Murdoch could be facing charges in the death of his wife and son. That's right. Several sources tell our sister station that the former South Carolina attorney is expected to be indicted for their murders this week. Since their deaths, a series of revelations have come about Alex Murdaugh. He's now facing a total of 83 charges for several crimes, including fraud, money laundering, and taking settlement money meant for a family of his housekeeper who died at his home. This means that investigators actually did find some evidence that points to his guilt in these murders. And as of Friday, July 15th, the indictment has been served. He was charged with two counts of murder and two counts of possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime. It's you know pretty reasonable to suspect that they probably have some type of physical evidence connecting him to the crime, especially because there has been no known confession from Alec. In fact, he's saying that it's not true, that he loves his family. We don't have a confession or admission that we are aware of by Alex. So this would have to be some physical evidence, maybe um, gun ownership records to establish that he owns these weapons. It could be fingerprints on the shell casings. At this point, there's also talk of potential blood spatter on Alec Murdoch's 
clothes, which Alex said that he wasn't at the house when the shootings actually happened. There's also reports of a cell phone video. Apparently it's audio only. And if it's real and it's time stamped and they end up proving that it was from the day of the shootings, that combined with the blood spatter would just completely wreck his alibi. Like I said, he says he loves his family and he didn't do this. His son Buster is still visiting him in jail. Of course, all we can do is really speculate about why Alec would want to kill his wife and his son. Could it be connected to the boating accident? Quite possibly. A lot of you from the beginning when I first covered this case said that you believe that Alec was involved in the shooting. From the way that the shooting played out, that's what would make most sense, especially when you counter in his other just strange behavior and everything that he was doing financially behind the scenes. But this is going to be very interesting to see play out. I definitely want to know what you guys think about how this is all going to play out in court and why you think he would kill his wife and son. Obviously, there's just a lot that we don't know at this point. There's clearly a lot of evidence that SLED has that we're just not hearing about at this point. As for Curtis, the man that Alec had hired to attempt his suicide, there are a couple updates on his case as well. Curtis has been indicted by a state grand jury on several charges. Smith was also indicted for four counts of money laundering, three counts of forgery, trafficking, methamphetamine, and two counts related to drug possession. Smith appeared in Richland County today for a bond hearing. He was granted a $250,000 bond with the conditions he wear an ankle monitor and take periodic drug tests. Smith had not previously been indicted by the state, only by Hampton County, in what was described as a botched suicide attempt. We also found out that Alex wrote Curtis a total of 437 checks between 2013 and 2021, totaling more than $2.4 million, which was used by Curtis to help Alex conceal his financial crimes. And it's also believed that Curtis used some of this money to purchase drugs for Alec. So right now, that's pretty much where we're at with the Alec Murdoch case in a nutshell. Hopefully, we will hear when the trial is going to take place relatively soon. And let me know if you guys want to continue seeing updates from me on this case, or maybe you want me to cover it later down the road on my podcast, Mile Higher. I'd be happy to do that as well. This one is so interesting to me. Okay, so let's switch gears and talk about what's going on with Casey White. So I covered the Vicki and Casey White case about two months ago. And just so you're not confused, those two were not married. They just happened to share the same last name. If you haven't seen that video, basically Casey White was an inmate and Vicki White was a jail guard and she helped Casey escape from prison. There's a whole backstory to that case. Very interesting. I recommend watching the video, of course. But basically, Casey and Vicki pulled off this escape on April 29th, 2022. Casey White was in jail for several different reasons, including a crime spree that he went on in 2015, where he stole multiple vehicles and attempted to kill his ex-girlfriend. Casey was and is also facing charges for capital murder for the murder of Connie Ridgway, who is an elderly woman that he is suspected of killing. So Casey and Vicki White fell in love while he was in jail. And Vicki, who it seemed was a very responsible, upstanding citizen for the most part, somehow got convinced by Casey, presumably, to help him escape. The plan was for him to get out of jail and then the two of them were gonna go run off together and you know live out their lives. But surprise, surprise, the plan did not work out so well. For a while, they couldn't find them. There was a huge manhunt going across the country. That's where I first heard about the case on Twitter, just keeping up you know, with updates as people were trying to figure out where they were. But eventually, Casey was spotted on security footage at a car wash in Evansville, Indiana. The police were notified of this sighting, and after 11 days, officer found the motel where Casey and Vicki had been hiding out. Side note, this motel was literally charging extra for people to stay in the room as an experience, the Casey and Vicki White experience. And at least 70 people are on a wait list hoping to stay in the same room Casey White and Vicki White were hiding in at a Motel 41 in Evansville, Indiana. A clerk told me the room is going for $75 to $100 a night. The regular rate is $63. So after they found them, a car chase ensued. And during the chase, Vicky somehow ends up calling 911. And it's not known if she did this on purpose or on accident. It's kind of strange how it all plays out. But here is that call. 911. Uh -huh. 
So during the chase, the car flips, and according to police, Vicky then took her gun and shot herself, ending her life. And Casey has said that it was their plan that if they got caught, both of them would die. The plan, I guess, was for her to kill herself, and then he would die in a shootout with police. And clearly, part of that plan did work. Vicky died. And Casey, on the other hand, was able to be apprehended by the police. So what's the newest update in the case? Casey is now being charged with first degree escape and felony murder for the death of Vicki White. And even though there is tons of evidence that Casey clearly did escape from jail, his guilty plea will also extend to the escape charge. His legal team has said that they have just not received a lot of the discovery in the case. So there will be some time before they can speak more on what exactly is going on. However, they do say that they want to see the autopsy report and they plan to focus heavily on the fact that Casey was not the one who pulled the trigger and ended Vicky's life. You know, we want a copy of that autopsy because we understand what the coroner has told you previously. However, that's going to be a key uh, item of evidence when we try this case. Uh, that it's extremely important to show that Casey White uh, was not the individual that shot Vicki White. Uh, Casey uh, will plead not guilty. We will certainly hold the state to their burden of proof, which is uh, beyond a reasonable doubt in this matter. And we will make sure that Casey's constitutional rights are are uh, taken care of during the course of these proceedings. They say that next steps will come from a judge who will be in charge of scheduling an arraignment and all hearings related to these charges. So that is pretty surprising. I mean, at least I was surprised. I didn't think they would actually charge him with her murder, but I feel like they have a decent case and he very well could be found guilty. I'm sure there's a lot in this case as well that we just don't know at this point, probably about their history, things that they have uncovered in their relationship, maybe more ways that he was manipulative. Who really knows? I want to know your thoughts though. Did you see that coming? And do you think he will actually be found guilty? And next up we have Sherry Papini. Mm. So like I said, Sherry's case is one that I have actually covered now twice. This all took place in Northern California in 2016 when Sherry Papini, a wife and mother of two, went for a jog and she was allegedly kidnapped. She was missing for 22 days. And during that time, her husband, Keith, rallied the community for support, you know, physically to help go out and search, mentally for their family and financially. And people have been very wary of him, but we will talk about that in a second. Even while she was missing, a lot of people were very suspicious of if she was actually missing or if she left on her own accord. But after 22 days, Sherry was found at 4.30 a.m. off of Interstate 5. And when authorities came to rescue her, she was bound by chains. For years, Sherry told this intense story about her kidnapping, everything that she went through, all of the brutal details. And the premise of her story was that two Hispanic women kidnapped her and spent three weeks abusing her. She said they starved her, they cut her hair, they branded her. And when I had covered it, it was was still unknown whether or not the story was true. There was a lot of speculation at the time that she could have been making it up, but you know, I presented it in the most unbiased way that I could, even though I was heavily leaning towards this is bullshit. And most of you were feeling the same way. I'd say there was definitely a decent amount of comments that were more on her side saying like, well, who would make this up? There's no way we need to believe victims. And I totally saw that argument as well. But the majority of you were like, something is off here. This woman is lying. Turns out she was lying. The whole thing was a hoax. The FBI found out in 2020. So that's when I covered it for a second time. And I will have both of my videos linked below. But my latest video isn't really an update. It's more of a full you know, picture of it. So you could really just watch the latest one to be up to date on the case. So yeah, the FBI came to her. 
showed her the evidence that they had to prove that she was lying. And even then, she continued to just lie and deny the whole thing. But the straw that broke the camel's back was Sherry's ex-boyfriend. A DNA match confirmed that he had been spending that time with Sherry while she was allegedly being abused by these two Hispanic women. And not only did she make all this up, but she was found to have defrauded the California Victims Compensation Board for an amount exceeding over $30,000. Sherry's bond was set at $120,000, and after after posting bail, she was released awaiting trial. Sherry's sentencing was actually scheduled for July 11th, 2022. So I was hoping that I would have that in this video, but her attorneys have asked the judge to postpone to September 19th. But her trial won't be to prove guilt or innocence because on April 18th, Sherry actually pleaded guilty herself to one count of making false statements and one count of mail fraud. The Redding mom who faked her own kidnapping and torture formally admits to the crime today in court. And in a surprise move, the judge issued a warning. The 39-year-old wiped her face trembling today as she apologized for the elaborate hoax. The judge reminded her that she could not change her plea and warned that when it comes to sentencing, her punishment could be more severe than she's expecting. This was part of a larger plea deal that would bring her possible jail sentence down dramatically. She was facing 35 felony charges and up to 25 years in jail, but by pleading guilty, she now only faces 8 to 14 14 months, which is just mind blowing. You guys don't even have to tell me how you feel. I know how you guys are going to feel about this one. It is unbelievably unfair. And Sherry actually made a statement about her actions. I will read it now. She says, I am deeply ashamed of my behavior and so sorry for the pain I've caused all my family, friends, and all the good people who needlessly suffered because of my story and those who worked so hard to try to help me. I will work the rest of my life to make amends for what I have done. Sherry will also have to pay $300,000 in restitution. And the new sheriff for Shasta County believes that taking the plea was her only choice. He thinks that Sherry knows that if she went to trial, she would be found guilty, obviously, and charged with the maximum sentence, which is what most of us would like to have seen. But, you know. She had no other choice because she's caught. And she knows as if this thing comes to actually goes to trial and we start parading in the witnesses and all the evidence that we've got, she's got nowhere to go. I'm very confident we would have got a conviction if that went to trial. It is also possible at this point that other people will be indicted for her crimes because clearly she did not act alone, but right now her husband is not the focus. If anyone else is going to become the focus, it's likely going to be those who aided her during her hideout. Keith, her husband maintains his innocence and filed for divorce on April 22nd this year after 12 years of marriage to Sherry. And he also made a statement saying this, now that I have learned the truth as reflected in the plea agreement, I must act decisively to protect my children from the trauma caused by their mother and bring stability and calm to their lives. I wish to make it clear that my goal is to provide a loving, safe, stable environment for Tyler and Violet, and I believe that the requested orders are consistent with that goal and the best interest of the children. But for the most part, that's all we have to go over right now. People are still kind of up in the air about Keith. Some people feel really bad for him. Some people are convinced that he's involved. We'll have to see on that. As of right now, her next hearing is September 2022, unless it's moved again. We'll see. So that is all I have for you guys on these three cases. I really want to know your thoughts. Also, let me know what you think about me doing more videos like this in the future if you would like to see more shorter case summaries and updates. That's it for me today, guys. Hopefully this is not my last video before maternity leave. I really think I'm gonna be able to do at least one more. Let's cross our fingers. If not, like I said, I do have a couple of videos pre-recorded, so you'll be seeing those during my leave. It won't be a full schedule of, you know, a video every week. They'll be more sporadic. If this is my last video and you would like to keep up with me and baby, I will link my Instagram account below. It's Kendall Ray on YT. That's where I will be keeping you guys updated. I also have a vlog channel where I'm doing occasional vlogging to document my pregnancy. I will have that linked below, but that is going to be all for me this week, guys. Hopefully I'll see you next week, but until then, stay safe out there.